the idea of mean free path. So the molecules in a gas travel in a straight line until they run into something. The average distance that they travel in the straight line before they run into something is called the mean free path. Mean is another word for average. So it's the average free path that they travel. That mean free path is going to decrease as the pressure increases. When the pressure increases, the particles are closer together and they're going to bump into each other and to the walls more frequently. Just so you get an idea of how large the mean free path is, if we had nitrogen and it was the size of a golf ball, it would go about 40 feet before it ran into something. That's quite a bit. So that leads us to diffusion and effusion. These are two different processes by which gases spread out. So diffusion is when gases spread from a high concentration to a low concentration. And um, this is where we can talk about passing gas, right, or cutting the cheese or breaking wind. Um, someone in my family recently ate too much ice cream, and that resulted in some very stinky farts, right? And you've all been in a room where someone did that, right? And you've got this stench, right? And it's concentrated. It just came out of someone, but it spreads throughout the whole room, doesn't it? Right? That's diffusion. Does this correlate with the call you got the other day in class? That does not correlate to the call that I got. No, this was something that happened over the weekend. So, diffusion. Heavier particles are going to diffuse more slowly than the light particles. Why do you think that is? Velocity. Average velocity. The heavier particles are moving slower at the same temperature because their average kinetic energy is the same, but because they weigh more, they're going to move slower. So the lighter molecules travel faster and will diffuse faster. Um, another way in which gases move is called effusion. And this is um, a gas escaping through a small hole in the container into a vacuum. So this is not something that we run into every day, but we see a, a process that's similar to this in balloons. So if you think about a latex balloon that's filled with helium, and it's floating and it's fun and everything, and like two days later, what happened? It's on the floor. Why doesn't it float anymore? Because some of the helium came out. How did it get out of the balloon? Did someone untie it and let some out? It went through the tiny little pores in the latex. Mylar balloons have, if they have pores, it's much, much smaller. Mylar balloons last a lot longer. There's also this liquid that you can get to coat the inside of the latex balloons that helps block up some of those pores and makes the balloons last longer. If you use a higher quality latex, it's going to have smaller or fewer holes, and so the helium won't be able to get out as fast. That's a similar idea, though, that the gas is leaving a high pressure situation for a lower pressure through a small hole. We see that the rates of diffusion and effusion of a gas are both related to the average velocity. Because the velocity is related to the size, the mass, then rates of diffusion and effusion are also related to the mass. So uh, rate of gas movement is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. And this is where your book um, goes into a really cool derivation that I'm not going to go over. But here's an illustration of effusion. So here we have a container um, with gas particles in it. And over on this side, originally there were no gas particles. That would be a perfect vacuum. There's a little tiny hole here. And the way the gas escapes is these guys are just, they're oblivious to the fact that there's a, a vacuum over there or that there's a hole. They're just doing their thing. They're just going in a straight line until they run into something, and then they're bouncing off, and they just keep doing that until one of them happens to head straight for the hole and just goes through. The rate at which that happens depends on how fast the particles are moving. 
So think about these guys just going really slow, bong, bong, bong. It's going to be a long time before many of them happen to hit the hole. If they're singing around really fast, they're going to hit the hole more frequently. Does that make sense? Yes. So say we had like um, we had two balloons and they were each in dark rooms and one room was colder than the other. Mm -hmm. The one in the warmer room would shrink faster than the colder room. Because the yes, I be I believe that um, you'd also have to compensate for pressure, and pressure with balloons is a little uh, a little iffy because their volume and their pressure is is kind of related in an odd sort of way. But yes, if you had two balloons that had the same pressure, same gas inside of them, but one was at a higher temperature, that balloon would go flat faster because the particles in it are moving faster. Yep. Yes? Would you not be able to do that in an experiment, though, because would the temperature, mean the one at the higher temperature, have less molecules than the one at the lower temperature if you had to have the pressures the same? Um, possibly, yeah. If you have the same amount of gas in each balloon and you increase the temperature, the one balloon increases in size, mm -hmm. right? And then when you increase in size, you've got stuff going on with the pores and how many there are and how large they are, and so you've got all kinds of other things happening. But if, yeah, if you controlled them so the balloon size was the same, and one was at a high temperature and one was at a low temperature. If the balloon size is the same, then the pressure is the same. And then, yeah, you could do it that way. I was trying to figure out how to do the experiment. Yeah. I think a simpler experiment would be to take two identical balloons, fill one with air, and fill one with helium. Okay. And just keep them in the same place, same temperature, and watch what happens. It might take a couple of days for you to really be able to see much. But, but what is all of this predicting will happen? Which one will go flat faster, the helium balloon or the air balloon? The helium balloon. Why? Well, they're smaller, but the reason it goes flat faster is that they're moving faster. They're moving faster because they're smaller. But it, it is not that the molecules in air don't fit through the hole. That's not it. So it's because air is consistent of multiple different things. Air is happen. mostly nitrogen, which is significantly larger than helium. Mm -hmm. And so the gas particles are moving slower, and so they will escape through the latex slower. Question in the back first. So we can temporarily make a vacuum, but eventually over time, the gas particles will go... It's, it's very hard to make a perfect vacuum. You've probably heard the saying, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So, so space isn't a true vacuum, right? The particles well, there are particles in space, and so, yeah, it's not a perfect vacuum, but it's a virtual vacuum. Wow, the questions. He was next. <laughs> in that model, could you eventually get all the molecules on the one side, or once both sides were balanced, would it kind of... That's a good question. So, so eventually, would all of these particles end up on this side? But that would make a vacuum on the other side. That would make a vacuum on the other side. What's going to happen is now we've got particles on this side, they're bouncing around, and they are occasionally going to hit that hole and go to the other side. So it would pretty much balance out. With it's going to balance out. You're going to end up with an even, even distribution. Yes? So if you shoot an arrow farther, it is colder because the air molecules are moving slower? Um, can you shoot an arrow farther when the air is cold? Um, there's a lot of factors in there besides how fast the gas molecules are moving. The gas, it'll also, that'll affect the density of the gas. And if the density increases, then the friction's going to increase. And so you have to think about all the different factors. Hmm? Not necessarily, yeah. But see, you guys are starting to think like scientists. And, and these are the sorts of things that scientists sit around and think about, and then they're like, huh, well, I want to find out about that. And so then you design some experiments. You can go out and try stuff. And then when it doesn't work the way you think it did, then you learn stuff because you have to try to figure out, well, why didn't it work that way? And a lot of times it's 
variables that we didn't realize were there. And that's one of the things that bugs me about biology is there's just way too many variables, right? It's really hard to control all the variables on living organisms. It's much easier with dead things. Never living things, really. Okay, so let's, let's use this equation. This comes um, from this whole idea of the different velocities. So the rate of A to the rate of B of effusion is the square root of their, the inverse of their molar masses. Okay, so let's do this one. Find the ratio of effusion rates of hydrogen gas and krypton gas. I mean, we can look at this and identify which one's going to effuse faster. The helium? I'm sorry, the hydrogen or the krypton? The hydrogen, because it's smaller. But the equation we need is the rate of one, let's say rate of hydrogen, over the rate of krypton. And that's going to be related to the inverse of their molar masses. So we got molar masses in here, um, but the krypton's on top and the hydrogen's on the bottom. Now technically this is kilograms per mole, but if we did it, did it in grams per mole, would it work? Yeah. yeah, because the units cancel out. As long as these units are the same, it's going to be okay. So molar mass of krypton is 83.8. Eight zero. 83.80 grams per mole. And hydrogen is 2.016 grams per mole. See, the units cancel out. You could convert it to kilograms, but it's not going to matter. So we have the square root of 83.8 divided by 2.016. Um, I guess maybe four sig figs, two, 6.447. So what that tells us is that the hydrogen will effuse 6.447 times faster than the krypton. It will escape through a hole 6.447 times faster. Any questions? But there's lots of things to take into consideration with that, right? Like, like a, um, say, like a container that's just stable versus like a container that's moving. Would that affect the particles? And like, um, if the if the container was moving or stationary, I really don't think that would affect it. Um, I think that this equation that we're using assumes that the temperature is the same. Because if you increase the temperature, the rate of effusion will increase. Mm -hmm. And so there are some assumptions built into this equation. And that's just approximate, right? Because it's random. I mean, you could have that be almost completely incorrect if it's just. Well, that's a good point. Um, is this approximate? Um, actually, I would say it's not approximate. I'd say it's pretty accurate because you're not talking about just one or two particles. And so the randomness, because if you're dealing with a reasonably sized sample of gas, yeah. you've probably got something close to Avogadro's number of particles. Mm -hmm. And so then all the randomness is going to average out. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, man. I forgot about this section. 